six. It does have spenteric actions. It keeps us from aspirating. It increases our intrathoracic pressure. So if you would all just hold your breath and bear down, that is a Valsalva maneuver, right? It allows us to cough. It allows us to lift things. So shutting off that airway um, does help us in everyday life. We just don't consciously think about the things that it does. I get my roller going the right way, Lisa. There we go. Cough reflex. It's triggered by objects touching the sensitive laryngeal mucosa. <clears throat> and some of you that have been dealing with patients that you're suctioning and stuff knows that it doesn't take much um, stimulation for our folks to really cough. It does help with phonation. The vibration of the vocal cords allows speech to be produced. And then it also helps with speech by moving up and down, relaxing and firming the edges of the vocal cords, changing the length of the cords. And remember the other pieces of speech would be the pharynx, the palate, the tongue, the teeth, and the lips. What stressors do your Lamone, does your Lamone book emphasize? Well, it does talk about tobacco use, alcohol, poor nutrition, HPV, and occupational pollutants as some of the stressors that can lead to laryngeal problems. Three out of four persons with cancer of the larynx are usually smokers. So there's a very high correlation between smoking and laryngeal cancer. Head and neck cancers account for approximately 45,000 new cases each year. Uh, larger numbers are in males. However, um, we are seeing an increase sometimes in our ladies and also in our non-Caucasian population due to the fact that smoking uh, has really not decreased too much in those areas, but sometimes has often increased. So what does your book talk about for prevention? Well, they talk about decreased smoking, obviously decreasing alcohol use, decreased exposure to, um, you can say pollutants, um, you know, if you're in a factory where you're working or even um, in, around your own home, depending upon what you're exposed to. Voice abuse. We know that this can cause polyps or issues on the vocal cords because you hear people that make their living by singing. Oftentimes will have to take a hiatus because they have a polyp on one of their vocal cords. And once they remove that, then they make them um, usually do some type of six months to a year where they're not singing and using their voice so that that vocal cord can completely heal. But it's like any other polyp, if they go unattended, they can convert into some type of cancer. So we would want to make sure that that doesn't happen. So they remove them. Plus it does interfere, interfere with their voice quality. So abuse can cause problems. And then people that have chronic laryngitis also can be at risk because you have chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation over time, year after year, um, can cause changes in cells and they can form um, some type of laryngeal cancer from that. <coughs> there are several types of laryngeal cancer that folks can get. The first one is superglottic or extrinsic cancer, and it accounts for about 35% of cancers. It's above the vocal cords. It includes the false cords and the epiglottis. There's usually no early warning symptoms. Um, oftentimes it's a lump in the throat or pain or burning with hot liquids, orange juice, 
could indicate that they have some type of ulceration through the mucosa and the tumor is already superficial. It's already coming through the tissues. And I know you know what that sensation would be like. If you've ever had a sore throat or something like that, and then you would drink orange juice, it probably is too acidic and you would complain that it burns. This is the same kind of sensation that they're having. <coughs> Excuse me. It does metastasize quickly and it involves both sides of the neck. There's a lot of um, rich lymphatic drainage in that area. And so if the tumor goes to that lymphatic area, it can travel then throughout the body. And then your letter D is just the 35%. All right, the second type is glottic. Can't, oh, they're super glottic. So you can see the tumor here. These normally should be nice and smooth. If you would look at vocal cords, this has a lot of irregularity to it. And I'll tell you a good time um, to have this looked at, they always take pictures of it, is when you have an EGD. Now we only do EGDs where they're looking at the esophagus and the stomach if you already have a complaint or issue. We do not do EGDs as a screening tool like you would a colonoscopy. But when they do the EGD, of course, the first thing that they come to are the vocal cords and they'll always snap a picture of those so that you have a record of what they look like. <clears throat> and on a rare occasion, we have had one or two patients where they'll have some type of irregularity and they will send the patient to the ENT and they'll come back and they will have had uh, some type of laryngeal cancer. Now, not maybe to the extent where they have to have a laryngectomy or something like that, but where they were diagnosed with laryngeal cancer and had to have treatment from it. So that's a, a good tool, a good time to be able to take a look at the vocal cords. <clears throat> Our glottic is the most common. Um, it involves the true vocal cords. The earliest symptoms that these folks have would be a change in their voice. Um, some type of hoarseness, like they've got a, a laryngitis, a mild case of laryngitis that just doesn't go away, or maybe a muffled voice. So it depends on which book you're reading as to how they um, quantify the symptom. If the symptom persists greater than two weeks, see the doctor. This would be especially true if you happen to be a smoker. Um, you know, if you're a non-smoker, it probably is for the most part going to go away for you. But if you have some type of persistent change and you do smoke, um, you would want to see them earlier rather than later to make sure that there's no issue. Glottic cancers um, do metastasize a little slower because of where they're located. There's not near as much lymphatic drainage. Um, so the metastatic process is slowed down. And letter E then is just the 60%. Again, I think that I already have in your notes. <clears throat> This is glottic cancer here. Um, again, see how nice and smooth this vocal cord is? That's what this one should look like. And we can do biopsies. I'm not doing them, but the physician can do biopsies of the tissue. And then that would give them the diagnostic exactly what type of cancer um, they were looking at. Obviously, we know it's laryngeal, but then how would we classify the different types? Subglottic, subglottic is a very low percentage of cancers. It only represents about 5%, so they're very rare. It involves the portion below the vocal cords. They are often, I have a letter C, asymptomatic um, until the tumor obstructs their airway. Okay, so not, not seen very often at all. What are some of our signs and symptoms then of laryngeal cancer? Well, <clears throat> hoarseness, we already talked about a change in the voice quality. Painful swallowing or dysphagia. Dyspnea, um, you know, we said if the tumor was large enough, it can't obstruct the airway. 
foul breath. The foul breath comes from the erosion of the mucosa and that tumor coming through the tissue sometimes can cause a uh, foul breath that you just can't quite seem to get rid of. Palpable lump in the neck. That usually comes from cervical involvement. Earache, they will complain of pain radiating to their ear. <clears throat> and then the only other one that I have on mine that I don't think I have on the slide would be weight loss. <clears throat> and oftentimes that is always, I shouldn't say always, but oftentimes an unexplained weight loss. But if you look back and you would say they were having difficulty swallowing, um, earaches, discomfort, then they may have slowed down on how much they're eating over the weeks and will lose some weight that way. But weight loss is also another one that's often included in some of the manifestations of laryngeal cancer. So how do we diagnose laryngeal cancer? There's a couple different ways. One is via an indirect laryngoscope, and you can see the caricature there on your um, lecture guide shows you that it is seen in a mirror. So you can see they have the reflective, like a dental mirror that they're putting back there. And what they're doing is having the patient do E, and that kind of moves the vocal cords and exposes them. And then you can see to the right of your lecture notes, um, the patient says, ah, and the vocal cords contract, but not tightly. The patient vocalizes E, and then you see a paralysis of the left cord or a paralysis of both cords. So those are the kind of things that they're looking for in indirect laryngoscopy. So it's a mirror and light. Direct laryngoscopy is the scope is passed in the larynx under a local or general anesthetic. Um, it is the vocal cords are observed. They were painted with a dye and the areas that soak up the dye are areas that we would be suspicious of carcinoma. So we would take the biopsies from those areas. Postoperatively, um, how long, how do we do the test um, for their NPO or gag reflex? Well, I'm sure you've probably done this before. You can use a tongue depressor and just uh, put it towards the back of the throat and see if their gag reflex is back. Testing their ability to swallow, we can do that, but I would give them a sip of water first. So in case they do happen to choke on it, that it's only water and not orange juice or some other type of um, fluid that could cause them problems, okay? I have down here two to eight hours. That would probably only be if they had a general anesthetic. If they're having more of a local or a conscious sedation, I would say within that one to two hours, they are probably good. And usually by the time they get in there, give the medication and get back to your room, it's probably been close to 45 minutes already. So uh, we let the first set of vital signs circulate another 15 minutes, and then they would probably be good to have a sip of water or something like that. But again, just just watch them, um, but I doubt it's gonna take the full eight hours unless, like I said, they have some type of general anesthetic. So we do take vital signs every 15 minutes. And there is a picture of a laryngoscope. So I hate to be the Debbie Downer, but you're gonna have to have Lisa date me. <laughs> and- <laughs> yeah, or give me some type of general anesthetic, okay, because I don't think I'm going to be very relaxed while you're doing that on me if we just have some basic sedation, so, or get out the hammer and just hit me on the head, I guess. It's the only thing bad about health care is you know what's coming. So, you want to observe for respiratory difficulties, 
again, you can see back on our, let me go this way. We could have some type of trauma with this. Um, I'm sure there are physicians that are better at it than others. And so at times I'm sure there are some, a little bit of trauma to the area. So we would be watching then for those respiratory difficulties and that's due to edema. Make sure that we're not having excessive pain in the throat or chest, swelling in the throat or neck, apprehension. Some of that can come from medications. Um, I've been in the room where sometimes when we give Versed, there's a fine line between they can comprehend what you're saying to the point that you've given them enough medication that they still don't listen to you, but they're unable to now. Does that make sense to you? Now they're kind of, um, we kind of like, uh, I think we gave a little too much, like they're beyond comprehending what you want them to do. They no longer understand and lay still. They're kind of like in a verse at twilight and no amount of reasoning is going to calm them down. Um, it, it just isn't going to happen unless you give them so much that you almost stop the breathing. But yeah, um, apprehension, they kind of get a little squirrely on you with some of the medications. And then are they expectorating blood? We might expect a little pink tinge. Um, it's like anything when you've passed it over your oral mucosa, sometimes there is a little bit of trauma, but it shouldn't be bright red blood. It shouldn't just be you cough up a clot or anything like that. That would be something that we would definitely not expect to happen. The next thing we're doing is providing for safety. Remember these patients had either general anesthetic or a very heavy conscious sedation, or maybe even had a deep sedation, a moderate sedation. Uh, well, that is conscious sedation, but a deep sedation, especially if the anesthesia is doing it. So there are going to be drowsy. And then we have try swallows of water first. We talked about that um, above. And whenever you have any medications like that, you have to have a driver. They can't just drive themselves home later in the day. Those medications stay on board for quite a while, so they have to have a ride, especially if you're doing as an outpatient. Diagnostic studies, other things that can be done for laryngeal cancers, uh, soft tissue x-rays, barium studies, CT scans, MRIs, PET scans. PET scans will tell you if there's tumors throughout the body, you know, or are they just located within the laryngeal area themselves. Abnormal findings would be a thickening or a deformity, irregularity of the mucosal membranes, something that's fixated that normally should be mobile in the larynx itself. Okay. What do we do then for our person that has some type of laryngeal cancer? Well, recommendations is going to be determined by the stage of the cancer or the extent that it, that it is. So one of the first things or one of the one treatments that we could do is radiation therapy. Radiation is going to be used for early glottic or intrinsic cancer and the cure rate is about 80 to 90%. They can either have external or internal radiation um, so external would be just that the beam is located towards the neck and we project the radiation that way, or we can implant seeds like you would for a, a prostate cancer. They put the beads directly into the area. Those beads don't get removed. They just eventually lose their radiation uh, capability, usually within about a month or so. And then hopefully that will have destroyed all the cancerous tissue and it will not come back for them. It can be palliative in conjunction with chemotherapies. Um, remember, when you have radiation, we will need to wait a while before they have surgery because radiation for this extent probably is not um, able to pinpoint it 100 percent. So you do destroy some of the surrounding good tissue. And if I was to do radiation therapy on you for six weeks, we do have damage to good tissue. We want that to heal. If not, 
our ability for the sutures to stay in place or for it to heal would be minimalized. Okay, so we do radiation, then we give a period of time where they heal from the radiation, and then we'll do the surgery. I think you're finding that a lot now with like mastectomies and stuff, that we do radiation first, we let them heal from the radiation, and then we'll do their surgeries. And then possibly have chemo and radiation post. But we have to give a time for them to heal from it. All right. This particular treatment does preserve their voice, although their tone may be affected. We talked about radiation for up to about six weeks. And radiation oncology is open for the most part every day except for holidays. And I don't know, I know they're not open on Sundays. I don't know if any radiation oncology does Saturdays, but through the week unless there's a holiday. So they would go every day for six weeks. There are side effects to radiation, sore throat, difficulty swallowing, dry mouth. It can um, affect the uh, salivary glands, so we have to be careful with that. And we said it can cause hoarseness. I've seen folks that have had radiation therapy for like tongue cancers, and they will have such bad sore throats that they actually have to have a G-tube or J-tube for feedings because they cannot swallow their own spit. It's so painful because it's sore, it's like raw in there. So um, sometimes the same case here for these folks. So if you have a family member or a patient that's going to be having this done, they'll definitely be take, keeping a close eye out for their nutritional status because when they get to that point, um, we don't want them to be debilitated from not being able to eat or drink. I don't have a slide for chemotherapy, but your book does talk about chemotherapy as a multi-drug approach. Um, 5-FU and cisplatinum are a couple of drugs that have been around forever. They can use that. They can also use uh, chemotherapy to treat metastatic um, cancers from laryngeal cancer or palliative treatment when the cancer is not resectable. Sometimes it can shrink the tumor a little bit make their airways better, make their swallowing easier so they, they can consume um, food and fluids. The next thing we're going to talk about are the different types of surgeries. So you're going to fill in this little um, grid today and I'll kind of help you um, put things in a certain place. So the first one is laser surgery. These are where tumors are reduced or destroyed by the laser beam. It's done via a laryngoscope. So the tumors are reduced or destroyed by a laser beam and it is done via a laryngoscope. And then under voice quality, they have a normal voice to some hoarseness. Okay, so they're over in the voice quality. It is normal to some hoarseness. Okay, the second type is transoral cordectomy. And this is a small lesion on one of the cords. So it's going to be removed. They do have a normal voice. It is resected again via that